we're going to call this meeting. So if we can uh, please stand. We do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. If we can uh, please, um, well, let's do the roll call first, please, Patty. Uh, Mayor Marciano. Here. Vice Mayor Litt. Here. Council Member Marino. Here. Council Member Woods. Here, ma'am. Council Member Lane. Here. Um, my friend here, Carl Woods, just asked if we could have a moment of silence for the uh, trooper that was uh, sadly shot uh, yesterday. So if we can have a moment, please. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, additions, deletions, modifications to the agenda? No, sir. Well, we have a number of announcements and presentations today. If it's okay with the council, I'd like to move uh, announcement E up one. So we'd move, we'd switch D and E. The four items, including E, are really sports and golf related. So we'll try to continue all four of those um, uh, presentations together. So our first presentation uh, for the mayor's uh, veteran check presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having us. Um, we are here to, um, Casey Mitchell, Director of Golf at the Sand Hill Crane Golf Club for the record, and Michael Armit, Golf Operations Manager. We are here to present the check for the VA this year for our annual Mayor's Veterans Golf Classic that took place in November. For those who do not know, it is um, hosted annually in November along with uh, Veterans Day. We have a Ladies' Nine Wine and Dine on Friday, the evening before um, the Golf Classic, which happens on Saturday. We have several ways in which we do fundraising, including raffle, silent auction, tournament sponsors, whole sponsors, player registration, closest to the pin competitions, which we hosted this year, um, on-course events, and then donations. Um, the tournament and everything leading up to the tournament benefits the West Palm Beach VA Resource Center, which helps our local indigent um, and homeless veterans. The tournament began in 2006, and we've raised, as a city, $330,000 um, to date. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Maria Wynn, the Assistant Director from the VA Resource Center, to give you a little more information on how the funds will be used. Good evening. As stated, I'm Maria Owen. I'm the Assistant Director of the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center. I would like to take this moment to thank the Mayor, the City of Palm Beach Gardens, the sponsors, and those who took part in the Mayor's annual Veterans Golf Tournament for this generous donation on behalf of the Medical Center staff and the veterans we have the honor to serve. For more than a decade, Palm Beach Gardens has been a vital and steadfast supporter of veterans receiving care at the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center. Uh, more than $330,000 has been donated to help local veterans. At the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center, our vision is to earn our veterans' trust by consistently delivering compassionate and quality care. In order to do that, we not only focus on veterans' medical needs, but also their economic and social needs. Our homeless programs have served more than 1,200 individual veterans and their families just this past year. Many of those families have benefited from your generous donations. Proceeds from the event have allowed us to furnish new homes for veterans receiving help through our supportive housing program, assist with deposits to turn on veterans' utility services, such as electric, water, and gas, pay for transportation when veterans do not have transportation home after hospitalizations, and so much more. The City of Palm Beach Gardens commitment allows us to support veterans experiencing homelessness, financial, nutritional, or housing insecurity in the local community. This year's donation will also contribute to programs being provided in our new domiciliary, which will open on February 20th, 
I'll submit the information and um, personally invite all the council members and sponsors to this event on February 20th. You have made and continue to make a real difference in the lives of the veterans we serve. Thank you again for your commitment to serving America's heroes. So tonight we'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors, starting with our presenting sponsor, um, our, police, our Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation. So joining us tonight is Erwin Edenson, the president of the foundation. We had two Albatross sponsors this year joining us tonight, Max Lohman from the Lohman Law Group. <laughs> Alan Norton and Blue could not join us tonight. Our Eagle sponsors, joining us from the Honda Classic, Bryce Sartori. The Palm Beach Gardens Youth Athletic Association, Tony Badala, he could not join us tonight. TBC Corporation, Jamie Levin, who also could not be here tonight. Representing Avenir, Rosa Schechter. Representing as both a birdie sponsor um, and as a beverage sponsor, I'm going to call up two people together, um, PGA Corridor Association and Matheson Whittles LLP, Mr. Steve Matheson. Representing Chili's of Stewart, Mr. John Ernst and Mr. Brett Hill. Thank you. Representing Urban Design Kill Day Studios, Mr. Ken Tuma. Representing Dunkin' Donuts at the shops at IBIS, Mr. Stephen Alvar. And finishing our birdie sponsors who could not be here, Wallace Mazda. We had several beverage sponsors, which went over really well at this year's event. Um, PGA Commons and Soar Self Storage, Mr. Darren Walker. And unfortunately, the remaining sponsors cannot be here tonight. Uh, Do South Brewing, Twisted Trunk, and DS Eakins. Our lunch sponsor, who generously cooks and donates all of the food and the time, uh, the Big Heart Brigade, Ivana Bertuzzelli and Tom Dorita. Our breakfast sponsors who could not make it, Ask Our Brands Holding, Dunkin', Don Dunkin' Donuts North Lake, Lake Park, and Bagel Boys Jupiter. And finally, an event sponsor this year and uh, new to us, Operation 120, Renette Verhege and Alida Barrios. If I could at this time call all the sponsors back up one more time for one more picture with council. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of our volunteers. We had volunteers staying with us until 10 or 11 o'clock on Friday night for the Nine Wine and Dine, um, and several uh, volunteers with us at 5 o'clock the next morning. Um, including but not limited to our administrator from community services, Mr. Dave, David Reyes and his wife. Um, all of these people here put in a great deal of time and effort to make this a success. And I am proud to announce that this year was a record for fundraising. We raised $39,025.97. We do have the check here, so if I could get you guys one more time, I'm so sorry. If I may add, while you're coming back to your seats, none of this would be possible without all of the hard work and dedication of Casey and her staff. So congratulations to you for your hard work. Thank you. Yeah, you know, because of the um, tremendous success of the tournament and uh, the wonderful golf course, the clubhouse, the enthusiasm of the staff, this is our, one of our signature events of the city, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, the weather was fantastic. Nice job, Rochelle. And uh, we always look forward to that, and our sponsors are just happy to come and be a part of it because they understand the value of the VA hospital in our backyard. Uh, we have a lot of veterans that live in the area, so it's a great event, and uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move into um, the second presentation, kind of along the same lines of charitable donations. Um, we started an initiative at the Sand Hill Crane Golf Club a year ago um, in February to benefit our local charities and organizations. The golf management team got together and wanted to find a way to help um, local charities and organizations, and what we came up with was a closest to the pin um, event that we are hosting usually on Saturdays and Sundays, um, but a committee was started. Um, the members, the committee members made charity recommendations for the pilot program as well as some recommendations on how to um, promote uh, the events. The first charities and closest to the pin competition began February of last year, so we just finished our one year. So 19 local charities and organizations have received donations from this um, initiative. So $5 is collected at check-in from any willing participants. 80% of the entire amount that is collected over the month is split between two charities that were selected for that particular month. The closest to the pin winner for each individual day receives 20% of that particular day's um, winnings. Um, however, most people do end up donating back to the charities, which is nice. So over $2,100 has been paid out in golf shop credit to 119 winners. We um, have a, a rolling board in the golf shop, so it weekly displays all of the winners from um, the past events. 
So Round One Charities and Organizations, we started out with Susan G. Komen, our ladies like to do a play for pink. So that's how it kind of got started. Um, so Peggy Adams, Urban Youth Impact, Second Chance Puppies and Kitties, um, Community Health Center, A Place of Hope, and so on and so forth. These are all of the charities that were for round one. This is the last um, 12 months. We did a few um, months a little different. Um, when Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, we decided that we were going to try and raise money every day. We um, asked for participation every day for the month of September. A total of $1,990 was collected. $200 was paid out to the winner and $1,790 was paid out in a joint partnership to Christ Fellowship for their um, disaster relief efforts in the Bahamas. We did the same thing for the mayor's veterans. Part of the check that was just presented to the VA was, part of, um, was partly due to the Closest to the Pin competition. It was hosted every day in the month of October leading up to the uh, mayor's veterans golf classic. The overall closest participant for the entire month received a complimentary summer membership for this upcoming summer. The next 10 closest received $50 in golf shop credit. So a total of $2,440 was donated directly to the VA. We did a couple of uh, additional initiatives, um, one being a school supply drive in September um, and August and September leading into the school year. Participants that donated from a um, approved list of school supplies received a discount on their summer round. The um, beneficiaries were Alamander Elementary and Palm Beach Gardens Elementary this year. We did the December toy drive that was put out by the Toys for Tots through um, our Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation. And to incentivize participation, we offered a discount on their round if they brought in a toy new and unused for a child 15 or younger. Round two of our charities are listed um, above, including many of the ones that have um, participated with us either to raise money via um, hosting an event with us um, and some very obviously notable organizations in our area. Um, I do want to take a moment because this was definitely a joint effort, a team effort. Um, the finance department helped us set up all of the accounts, um, helped us with all of the financing and, and um, requests for checks for all of these um, donations. Council, city administration, and community services administration for your support in getting this off the ground. The Sand Hill Crane staff, particularly our golf shop attendants who really it almost became a competition to see if they could get the most donations for their shifts yeah you can't play golf there without getting shaken down for yes five <laughs> it's for a good cause um and most notably michael armit our golf operations manager who really took this and ran with it he came up with all of our flyers um sent out email blasts created newsletters um, tried to get the word out as much as possible to try and drive um, a lot of notoriety to this Candace and Madeline, who were there to help with the flyers and getting all of those out to the general public. And then the sign shop, Rob Brocklebank, who we sent many, many emails to, um, asking him last minute to print flyers because we had you know, a new charity that we wanted to add to the list um, and to promote it both on course and in the, the um, facility. So February of last year through January of this year, in total we raised $14,145 to go to the 19 local charities that we listed. Um, and the remaining charities are for this coming fiscal, or this coming year, February through January. So thank you all for your support. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Casey, for all you guys do. And the golf course is great, so keep reminding all your friends and neighbors and family members to go out and play because it's one of the best public golf courses you'll find. Um, next, we have Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation support uh, presentation. Erwin, I almost didn't recognize you with a suit on earlier today, so. Uh, my wife dressed me. So. Uh. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, Mayor, uh, council members, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, I am Erwin Edenson. I am the president of the Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation. 
As you know, about a year ago, uh, the Palm Beach Gardens Police Foundation became the Palm Beach Gardens Police and Fire Rescue Foundation. The expansion of the foundation resulted from meetings with Chief Shannon, Chief Breyer, along with some guidance from newly, then newly appointed Deputy City Manager Steve Stepp, who was the catalyst for the Police Foundation's establishment over 11 years ago. The foundation now supports all first responders in Palm Beach Gardens. With that background, let me review quickly the foundation's mission statement. The foundation provides financial support for education, training, equipment and new technology, community outreach, and <clears throat> emergency assistance. This last category is a recent addition to our mission statement. Approved this past December by the board, we added it to establish a budget for financial assistance to department personnel in special circumstances, such as a family emergency. So what did the foundation do in 2019? We awarded seven scholarships totaling $17,500 to police and fire rescue personnel family members. We funded $18,000 in reimbursement for police and fire rescue personnel. The foundation provided $15,000 for Suits for Seniors programs at Dwyer and Gardens High School. These programs help seniors prepare for what comes after high school. We were a $5,000 sponsor for the Ball Stars Basketball Camp, a summer youth mentoring program. $3,000 supported the Gardens Cup, the City Employee Spirit Team Tournament, and we were $5,000 presenting sponsor for the Mayor's Veterans Event, part of tonight's contribution to the Veterans Resource Center. The Police Explorers Youth Program received $27,000. $17,000 funded the Fire Explorers Youth Program, and in addition, the Fire Explorers just took delivery of their brand new $5,000 equipment trailer that we ordered last year. We provided $2,500 for the community's 2019 Public Safety Day, and we increased our support to $7,500 this year for the 2020 event. There's more, but I want to stay inside my time budget. The board of the foundation is comprised of volunteers who care about our community and those who protect and serve it. All are volunteers. We have no employees. Our overhead budget pays for regulatory fees, PayPal, GoDaddy, and other similar costs of doing business. I still use old envelopes from the Police Foundation and mark them up with the new name. I'll print new ones when we run out. Our annual overhead budget uh, is about 7% of projected revenues. We're a 501c3 corporation with an ex officio compliance officer, an attorney, who volunteers his time to assure we understand and comply with all the rules. Our ma major funding event is our annual golf tournament every October, and we sincerely appreciate attendance and participation by many members of the council and city leadership. But we rely on donations from the citizens and businesses in Palm Beach Gardens who value and appreciate the dedication, professionalism, and compassion demonstrated by our first responders around the clock every day of the year. I'm honored to serve as the president of the foundation, and I know each and every one of you are personally committed to supporting the departments. You can be confident that the board is going to continue to do our part to help. I appreciate this opportunity to keep you informed about our activities. Thank you and good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to put item E, Operation 120. I'd like to ask Alita Berrios and. Would you like to? And Renette Verhage. Renette Verhage, if you can come up to the podium, please, and give us a presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Marciano and city members. Thank you very much for having us here this evening. Thank you to all the veterans that may be present with us this evening, and special thanks to our female veterans. My name is Alita Barrios, and I am the Executive Director of Operation 120. I have a very important question to ask all of you. How do you want to be remembered? Maya Angelou said, I have learned that people will forget what you said, 
People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you've made them feel. When we make space in our lives to help those in need, it is likely that we will inspire others to do the same. I believe that we truly, when we truly do, do good in this world, we're not only serving those we directly help. We are only, we are only, we are not only serving those we directly help, we are also serving those who witness our kindness. They feel the light we shed. Our joy leaves over the absurds by them and they are likely to pass it on with, uh, with their own good deeds. Today I'm sharing such an opportunity with you through Operation 120, the first organization in South Florida to provide short-term housing for homeless and at-risk female veterans while empowering them to integrate successfully into a healthy, happy, independent life after service. Our female veterans have served proudly in every branch of the U.S. military on active duty in the Air Force, Army, Coast Guards, Marines, Navy, National Guard, and the Reserves. Prior to joining this amazing charity, there was a lot that I did not know. Empowering and supporting women has always been hugely important to me. Today, I am very proud to say that with Operation 120, we're directly working to empower women and we're helping to stem the tide of the fastest growing demographic of homelessness veterans in America today. I am privileged to work directly with inspiring founder and president of Operation 120, Renette Berhage. When Renette learned that female veterans were living on the streets, under bridges, and in their cars, she was compelled to address this tragic condition and launch Operation 120 as a 501c3 in 2017. Renette identified the perfect house in Lake Worth back in October. It is not far from the West Palm Beach VA Medical Center, so our clients will continue to receive the medical assistance they need. And now, the dream of Operation 120 is a reality. We entered this new decade having achieved a huge milestone. Operation 120 Supportive Housing is now home to its first female veteran resident. Knowing that one last female veteran is wandering the street, it's not only comforting, it's empowering. <clears throat> Being the first organization to provide supportive housing, it gives us hope. However, it also reminds us that our work has just begun. Operation 120 would not rest until each of our women heroes has a safe, stable roof over their head. We're convinced that our mission of helping homeless women veterans began through providing supportive housing. Housing is perhaps the greatest of the many challenges they face. The West Palm Beach Veteran Affairs Medical Center is working to address the many needs of these deserving women, but resources are simply not available for supportive housing. You're probably asking yourselves, why aren't homeless veterans properly reported, evaluated, and assisted? The following are just a few of the most obvious reason, reasons. A large percentage of female veterans facing homelessness spend months and years couch surfing with family and friends. Many women are reluctant to go to shelter as they feel unsafe around the male shelter residents. Homeless facilities focus on the larger population who are much more likely than their female counterparts to reach out and utilize the VA service. Homeless female veterans with children are worried that by seeking help with their children, will be, their children will be removed from their care. Just like our female veterans, our female veterans have also demonstrated that they're willing to sacrifice everything, including their lives, for our country. 
I am sure that all of you consider that adequate reason to provide the help they need to return home to their lives with dignity, safety, and security. That's all they want. Isn't that what we all want for ourselves? Their mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, your friends, your neighbors. Many women have made the ultimate sacrifice, including more than 150 who give up their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. The brave women who survive need our help transitioning back to a, well, to a life well lived. For many reasons, female veterans experience greater challenges than their male counterparts. They need more specific support when they leave military service and have a harder time transitioning back to civilian life. For example, skills training in the military is not easily transferable to civilian jobs, comeback-related debilitating medical conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, female veterans are more than twice likely to develop PTSD than their male counterpart. Military sexual trauma, or MST, one out of four female veterans is sexually abused while they serve. Substance abuse related to combat trauma. Unemployment related to insufficient emotional stability the lack of housing slows their progress. Lack of affordable housing and no female only housing. As I mentioned before, we believe that housing is the first step forward. Our mission is to empower homeless and at risk female military veterans to reintegrate successfully into life after service. This female only transitional housing will s support positive movement towards independent living and full-time employment. They will now have a safe place to live where they will receive access to necessary programs such as training, job training, employment, and supportive services. In order for these at-risk women to regain their self-respect, dignity, stability, and sense of purpose, in-house counseling will be provided and encouraged. Following graduation from our program, a mentor will be assigned to each veteran. Operation 120 will not stop working until we provide the range of support our female veterans and ultimately their children so desperately need. Without your support, with your support, we will continue to strengthen our community partnerships Full utilization of community resources is critical to achieving success at all level. Let's commit today to work together with a clear sense of purpose and uncompromising commitment for good. Operation 120 is forging ahead to give back to our female veterans. We hope that you will join us. Thank you so much for listening and for opening your hearts and minds. As Mother Teresa taught us, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that, and, and you know, this is an organization I had never heard of, so thank you for bringing it to us, our attention, and um, it is now a part of our charitable giving for our tournament and other events, so. Next, I'd like to uh, call up Chief Bissett and Beth Stuglick, Accreditation Manager for Item D, Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services Award. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Mr. Ferris. Uh, Corey Bissett, Division Chief of EMS, for the record. I'd like to uh, be again here to uh, present an achievement that we uh, we're able to attain. But before I get into that, I'll turn it over to Beth to explain a little bit of the elements that went into this process. Good evening. So CAS is really primarily focused on all of our EMS operations from start to finish. Uh, we began our process back in September 2018. We had a group of 10 personnel from Fire Rescue who worked through 109 standards and putting together all the documentation that shows our compliance with those standards. 
Um, we submitted our application in July, which was pretty quick. We were really happy about that. Um, and it was subsequently accepted by the CAS staff at the end of July. So we hosted two industry experts in October of last year for a two-day site visit uh, that resulted in a perfect score, no deficiencies on all 109 standards. So we're extremely thrilled about that. Um, they reviewed our application in December 2019 at their panel meeting and conferred the maximum three-year accreditation term for us. So that was our initial grant and we're thrilled with that. So, <clears throat> so again, this was not just a, a single uh, you know, fire department thing. It took a collaboration between all departments in the city and uh, to really work together to make this happen. And, and you know, every time we come up here to, to present, whether it's an award or something like accreditation, it's not just us, it's all of us. And uh, I really, truly believe that we have the best city that works together uh, and we're second to none. And, and it really takes, you know, the people in the field and in the back there, you got to stand. There's a few men and women that, uh, you know, go out there day in and day out, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we can have the best. You know, we can have the best uh, guidelines and, and protocols and, and use the best equipment, which we're very thankful for, but without having the people to implement those protocols and those guidelines and to utilize that equipment, uh, we really would be going nowhere. And I, I truly believe that our department is uh, exceptional and we're second to none. And, and just to, to add a little more feathers in our hat, it's only the 19th agency in the state of Florida to be CAS accredited. The fifth duly accredited agency, so through CFAI, which we already hold, now CAS, only five departments in the state of Florida hold both of those accreditations. And we're the first in Palm Beach County to hold CAS accreditation and the only department to be dual accredited. So again, I like being first um, and, and hopefully no one else will will, will attain this dual uh, accreditation because uh, that's something truly that validates the work we do in the field and what our personnel do in the field and, and really shows that uh, uh, the validity to what we do uh, throughout the city to make this happen. So, so I'd like to present the plaque to the council if you'd like to come on down. Well, no doubt our city staff are excellent. It all starts from leadership and at the top at every department. And uh, the fact that our staff and all members of the staff are willing to work hard together um, really is a testament to, again, to the leadership of the city, to our city manager and fire chief and chief of police. And thank you for all you guys do. And as they say, if you're going to have an emergency, have it in public. So we'll move on to items of resident interest. In the interest of time, we can do what we want to do, but uh, I know we all go to a lot of meetings. But Rochelle, I'd like you to lead, and I'd also like you to make a comment, if you can, about the meeting yesterday with Palm Beach State College. So I'm sure I speak for the rest of us. Uh, for some reason, this January just seemed like it was busier than any other month we've had so far. 
a lot of city business, a lot of uh, community and county business. Uh, so I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of the big things from this month. Uh, the first being that uh, Marie and I attended Palm Beach County Days in Tallahassee. So did I. And Mark, yes, we did, and then the mayor, <laughs> right, you did. Sorry about that. Is Marie that and I drove up together. together. We drove together, so that's why that was in my head. Um, and the three of us were advocating on, on behalf of home rule and being able to make the decisions right here in Palm Beach Gardens that we need to make for what's right for our community. Um, we had a major League of Cities meeting uh, at the Sand Hill Crane. The attorney, Louis Rotundo, did a discussion of the origins of the city's mobility plan and the fee concept and how it got into state law. And that was fascinating to a lot of the other cities that were present and are considering following in our footsteps in, in the mobility plan area. Where is the students one? Okay. I spent uh, the morning with the students at the Meyer Prep Academy, and we did uh, talked about civics and government and leadership. Their student government organization is called the VOD Squad, and there were third through fifth graders and then sixth through eighth graders. And then the mayor and I also met with the students and faculty of SCORE Academy in Palm Beach Gardens, where we discussed civics, local government, and leadership as well. Um, I had a Palm Beach County Water Task Force meeting. And then yesterday, um, we had a meeting at Palm Beach State. Uh, it was myself, Deputy City, Man uh, City Manager Stepp, uh, city Engineer Todd Engel, the Provost uh, Nika Coleman Farrell. I believe there was a representative from an engineer from from the county, and I'm not sure what his name was. And the Student Government Association students. And what that happened was they have brought a problem to uh, administration, and they asked the community for their help. Um, it appears that many of them, the bus routes are letting them off on the far side of PGA Boulevard from campus, and they are having to cross PGA Boulevard in order to get to class on time. And we were all brought together along with the chamber uh, of, of Palm Beach North Chamber was there as well to discuss strategies for the safety of these 400 to 800 students daily who cross PGA Boulevard in order to get to class. There are also some issues with Campus Drive, and um, the city is going to be able to work with the college um, to help solve those problems. The Campus Drive problems we can help solve internally, and then the other problems we have to work with Palm Tran and the university. So uh, it was brave of the students. They did their own studies, they came up with the data, they sent out surveys, and they really did a great presentation to let us know uh, what the risks were, and I think it was uh, well taken by everybody who was there. Thank you. Matthew? Sure. As many of you know, I, like all of us, love constituent service, and I find it very fulfilling but I have a hidden partner in accomplishing this mission, and it's Janice Massey. She's one of the most thoughtful, well-organized, and diligent people that I've ever known. I call her with issues, and the matters are usually resolved within hours, and sometimes within 10 minutes. Last week, she resolved two <coughs> complex issues within five minutes. Our city manager demands excellence, and the citizens of Palm Beach Gardens are very fortunate to have Janice Massey working to make their lives better. With that being said, I'm gonna briefly cover some of the events that I attended, uh, Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce Government Affairs meeting, Green Market Anniversary, Ballon Isle South Golf Course opening, an economic forum presentation on our economy, a beautiful Arbor Day presentation, Palm Beach North 
chamber meeting with our county commissioners, League of Cities meeting, PGA Homeowners Association annual meeting, and met with the corridor. And that's it. Maria. I'm not meeting my 31 meeting. Okay. I'm not going to read my 31 meetings, but I will highlight some of them. I do want to say, <laughs> I do want to say that uh, we all attended the PGA National POA, and Lloyd Ecclestone was there. And the reason I'm, I'm saying that is because it was the 50th anniversary of PGA National, and it was developed by Lloyd Ecclestone. So he uh, came and spoke. Mark spoke. Our fire chief spoke. Our police chief spoke. And it's really, as three of us who are, live in PGA National on this council, it was uh, nice to see everybody come out for that. I do want to say what a wonderful thing the Ballon Isles constant, constant series was with the Motowners. And a special thank you to Amy Stepper and Monette Preston from the city who did a spectacular job. For those of you that weren't there, you all know our Veterans Plaza right outside. There were chairs from the plaza all the way to the parking lot. It was packed. People were dancing. People really enjoyed themselves. And it just, uh, just shows how our communities partner with us all year round. And this was a, a wonderful event. I did also want to say that um, I attended my first Loxahatchee River Management Coordinating Council meeting. Thank you very much for putting me on that. Um, <laughs> it, it was an all day long meeting. <laughs> There, there you go. There you go. Um, I, I did also MC the Melanoma Foundation luncheon, and that was that's really important to all of us. I don't know about anybody else, but I've had members of my family that have been severely impacted by melanoma, and it was my pleasure to MC that event for the second time. I also attended the Impact 100 Impact uh, 100 of Palm Beaches awards ceremony, and I'd like to send a special thank you out to uh, the Center for Trauma Counseling. They won a $100,000 impact grant. That's what this foundation does. Uh, $29,000 to Habitat for Humanity and $29,000 to the Lord's Place because their goal of Impact 100 is to get 100 women to all day donate $1,000 so you have one $100,000 grant. Just so happens that we're now closer, closer to 160 women so we were able to donate close to $160,000. Uh, I know that Ryan Darling is not in the audience today, but we do have a new uh, president of the Palm Beach Gardens Historical Society, and I know several of us went to that event. And I did go to the South Florida Fair to thank a farmer, because if you ate today, thank a farmer. And there were more, but I'm done. All right, Carl. All right, so um, Rochelle, you were, it's always this time of year that we seem to be super busy. So. Um, um, I'm going to go over a couple meetings that made a difference to me and they make a difference to the community. Um, but before I do that, getting off to the golf course, I was sitting at some bar, not in, not out of this city, and I'm sitting next to two guys and they're totally talking about Sand Hill Crane Golf Course and they're sitting right next to me. And uh, they were talking about the Z hole, which I think is what, 11? Um, 13. And so I had to chime in, and you know they talked about the course, and I thought it was pretty cool. It wasn't even in Palm Beach Gardens. These two guys were bragging about Sand Hill, so that was kind of cool. Um, I got invited again to speak at one of our communities um, that was having an association meeting. And uh, like the mayor, he was invited a couple months ago. Uh, Matt was invited to swing through so they could say hi to him. Rochelle was going to be on the list, but they know she ran unopposed, so they wanted to talk to Matt so they can get to know the council better. And um, actually spoke over an hour, um, maybe an hour and a half, touching on everything that we're doing from mobility to soccer to the kids to traffic, I-95, expansion projects, um, Twin Towers, FPNL, you name it, downtown at the gardens. And I think I had them exhausted after they were done. They didn't really have many questions, but you could tell that by the time they were done, they had so much information coming at them. They were happy. Actually, within the week, I had several people come up to me when I was at uh, Home Depot and wherever, and I didn't know who anybody was, and they just wanted to say hi to me again and say thank you for letting them know what's going on in the gardens. So um, one of the other things that we most of us went to was the Shabbat of Palm Beach Gardens where Rabbi Vigler ran the uh, anti-Semitism meeting, which is very important. Um, the, they had people come in and speak about the hatred that's going on against the Jewish community. And for such a small community, it's 
so highlighted the um, the hatred that goes on towards these people. So um, it was nice that that let them know that this council and this city supports their endeavor to um, shine light on this issue. So luckily, we haven't experienced that. We have experienced a little bit in Palm Beach Gardens, but not like the beatings of to random people walking in New York City and so on that uh, that happens. Um, I did go to a ribbon cutting ceremony, which is an uh, extension of the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. There is now a Lois Pope Center, and Lois Pope donated $12 million to build this um, facility for retina, retinal and mas macular degeneration. Lois, yeah, what's up? I got you. <laughs> So Lois is the widow of the founder of the National Enquirer, and uh, they were they really wanted the mayor to be there, because if you don't know, the mayor is an eye doctor. Um, so I lied. I said, my name's Mark Marciano, and I'm the mayor, but I'm a little too tall, so they kind of called me out on that. But um, the Cressy Sports Complex in the back, which if you guys don't know about it, um, it's a uh, kind of a therapy or uh, an off-season place where the, the major baseball players get to come and train and, uh, and do therapy and get ready for, um, for baseball. So that is now up and running in the back. And the beautiful part of the, why that makes a difference is because they're going to interact with our children. Our miracle field, which is the handicap field, is still dirt, but it's formed. And that is going to be a huge, huge thing to our community and our children which is the direction this city's been going for many years. And one of the proudest things is I was able to attend a breakfast where Chief Shannon was appointed the president of the Palm Beach County Association of Police Chiefs, which I think is a massive thing. <laughs> and um, you know I was a cop around here, long time chief. Worked under you for a schmidge. But the, the input that I, you know, I still have many, many, many friends that work on the police department and the, the, uh, the feedback that I get from the officers on the road or they really look up to you. And you other agencies struggle with, with chiefs and character issues or personality conflicts, but not with you. You're a real leader. And, you know, we're blessed to have someone like you to lead, you know, our, some of these kids, they're just kids. And, and, you know, they grow up in this community. And the Sergeant Evans, when you retired, or Cap Cal Captain, I'm sorry. Hey, I got out before you made Lieutenant, so. He's a perfect example of why he still works with our city. So I thank you, I thank you for your service, and, you know, you're a real blessing that we have. So for once I spoke more than all of you, so. Um, thank you very much. All right, so. Uh Start with the Government Affairs Committee meeting. Don't want to forget Public Safety Day was a tremendous success. Uh, the rain started, Rochelle. You weren't in town, but it stopped just before the 5K. Um, I know a number of the staff ran the 5K. I ran the 5K, not that fast, but I made it. Uh, it was a great day. So many kids. It's such a great thing to do at that park. So thank you to the staff for hosting the first and hopefully first of many future Public Safety Days and 5K runs uh, at District Park. Uh, the 18th anniversary of the Green Market was a great success, as always. It's a great place to be, followed by Ballon Isles Golf. Uh, we did spend three days, uh, a day in Tallahassee, day there and back. Uh, it is an important day to be there, so we can kind of work with our colleagues around the, around this, uh, this, the county. Um, Arbor Day, uh, I went to the Chamber of Palm Beaches breakfast with uh, Mayor uh, Keith James. We had our Palm Beach North Chamber State of the County address. Uh, League of Cities at our fabulous Sand Hill Crane, and everybody in the county, when they come, they just want to stay because it's a great thing. The weather wasn't great, though. Food was good. Food was good. Um, Economic Development Committee meeting. Um, the Historical Society had their meeting at Twisted Trunk. Uh, Score Academy with Rochelle, we went there. Palmy State College had a liberal arts conference. They had myself, uh, Mayor Keith James, Mayor Todd Vadraska, and Mayor Ann Gerwig uh, talking to the students. They had to be there because it was part of their credits, but I think they learned something about local government. We hosted our mobility plan meeting here at City Hall. It was, uh, it was good. Uh, continue to try to educate people and businesses about what it truly means 
to them and how it's going to benefit the residents of our city and our county. Crazy Sports, fantastic facility. Those guys are really big and they throw really hard. So I don't know how they hit those I balls, but I know it's crazy. Uh, Forum Club lunch yesterday. I, I was able to induct the National Honor Society at Dwyer High School yesterday. That was fun. And I want to send a, send a shout out to the librarian at uh, Duncan Middle School, Shannon Culp. She's a friend. She came to the city a few months back about putting up the little library. So uh, through staff, I think it was uh, Charlotte that helped with Shannon to put together these little libraries. There's going to be a few of them around the city. They're very cool. Uh, at the district park, go over there and you can see it. You can take a book. Please bring it back. But if you happen to feel like you have to steal it or keep it, uh, Shannon will be able to continue to fill that little library. So for all the families that go to the district park, um, especially if you have older siblings practicing or playing soccer or whatever they're doing, and they have a younger sibling, they can actually sit and read a book, which is actually pretty cool. So thanks to the city manager and staff for helping put that together. So that is my list. We're going to move on to comments from the public. First, we have Patrice Schroeder. Name and address for the record, please. Patrice Schroeder, I actually um, am with 211 Helpline. We are out of Lantana, at, uh, and our, we don't give our actual location because of the, the confidentiality, but it's PO Box 3588 Lantana. And I want to thank you for, again, supporting us with our um, 211 Awareness Week. Actually, throughout the United States, it is 211 Awareness Month, and 211 Awareness Week starts the 11th through the 17th. Now, I actually have been with this agency for 14 years, and the agency itself has been serving Palm Beach County for 49 years now. So next year will be our 50th anniversary. We average about 250 calls per day, and of that, 10 on average are of crisis nature. So for those of you who do not know 211, we're the local community helpline and crisis hotline. Last year, throughout our five-county area, we did answer close to 90,000 calls and contacts from individuals looking for help. Um, we, you know, Palm Beach County made up about 48,000 of those calls and contacts. Now, I, I think it's just appropriate because we've had uh, the theme veterans today. We actually have our new My Florida Vet program, which launched in May of 2019. We average about 30 veterans reaching out to us monthly. And just to give you a little side note, for those of you who are not aware, as a crisis line, we also answer the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is the Veterans Crisis Line. They are asked to press one. It takes them to a facility in, in New York. However, many of the veterans don't push one, and we, it rolls into our system, and we are trained to answer and work with them. But with this My Florida Vet grant, it helps us to take it to the next level. We have two uh, veterans that we were able to hire who are combat veterans that can do that peer-to-peer. -peer. So when they're reaching out and speaking with these veterans, they have that um, continuity of the, the understanding of what combat de entails and the struggles that these individuals go through. I also want to recognize um, Operation 120 because one of the number one calls that we get from veterans and the number one need is the housing piece. So anything we can do to alleviate that is awesome. Um, and the other sad note, too, within the stats for suicide with veterans, we do realize it's at 20 or 22, depending on whose reports you, you, you look at. But I just want you to note the female veterans, they are increasing in suicide rate. So it's important to note. I also want to spotlight um, another program, our Help Me Grow program. We are able to help do those um, developmental and growth screenings right over the phone. And this is a national initiative that has been acknowledged by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I want you to know that our 211 Help Me Grow team leads the state of Florida. Last year, we did over 2,000 growth and developmental screenings. So at any rate, I want during 211 Awareness Week, I want you all to take this moment to share the information about 211. We're helping to connect people to services. We're saving lives, but we also have additional programs. And I'm going to make one final comment. Um, I, I did attend the League of Cities meeting out at Sand Hill Crane, and it is just a beautiful facility. It's a jewel in the crown of your municipality. But I also have some video of 
six cranes that decided to walk leisurely down off the um, parkway and into the front <laughs> of my vehicle. So it was just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we do have a proclamation in our consent agenda today, and, and 211 is a very important service, so thank you for making note of that. Uh, next up is Doug Crane, our library director. Come on up, Doug. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, my business address is 3650 Summit Boulevard in West Palm Beach. Thank you. So I um, want to say thank you for having me here tonight. I uh, wanted to give you an update on the county library. And of course, Palm Beach Gardens is a member of the county's library district, which means that the Palm Beach Gardens branch of our, is your city library. And for the record, it's over on Campus Drive next to the courthouse. And I've had the honor of giving many of the council members a tour of our facility. I uh, wanted to share a few updates on what's coming on. One of the things that was significant last year was we dropped overdue fines. So from now on, there's no more fines in charge if your items are overdue. This was due to a lot of analysis across the country that fines simply don't work. And they actually inhibit people from using the library. So the only time you'd be charged is if you fail to return a book. We're going to send you a bill saying, hey, either pay for the book or give it back. And it seems to be working very well so far. So we're very excited about moving that way. A few things coming up. The library is going to be a key player in this year's census. We're, of course, as a county department, working with the whole of Palm Beach County government to move forward. And with many of the drive to have census um, done online, our library, if you've been over there, of course, has multiple computers and Wi-Fi for people to come in and do their census. And if they have some trouble getting on, our librarians and uh, library staff will be there to help them out. We also expect to hold some extra activities to highlight census. Uh, this year, of course, there's elections, and the Palm Beach Gardens Library will serve as an early voting site for in March, August, and October for those three early voting periods. And of course, being a presidential year, we expect the uh, October election to be extremely busy for early voting. Uh, so we're looking forward to supporting the community as we do every year by being an early voting site. This summer, we'll continue our partnership with the school district to offer summer lunch service. This is a free service that the school district brings in lunches, and anyone from age zero to 18 can come in and get a free lunch. Their parents, if they want a lunch too, can pay simply $3 to get a lunch as well. And over the past three years, the library system, in partnership with the school district, has served over 100,000 lunches and snacks to children in Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. Uh, finally, I wanted to share that our government research service is available. I mentioned this on the tours. It's a free service. Our librarians are here available to provide research, not only to our elected officials, but to our any government employee in Palm Beach County. And it's a free service. We're able to provide information in a nice package on any question that you may have. I brought with me tonight our Happenings newsletter and our A to Z library services. They're over with Patricia, and she can hand them out at the appropriate time. But I wanted to thank you all for your ongoing support of public libraries in Palm Beach County. And I can answer any questions you may have. You know, thank you, Doug. Does anybody have any questions for Doug? I know I went on the tour. It's fantastic. I used to be there a lot when the boys were little. And uh, it's a great facility. And it's a great service to our city and the whole county. So I appreciate you coming, Doug. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, Steve Matheson. Name and address for the record. Good evening. I'm Steve Matheson. I'm here tonight. I'm 121 Emerald Key Lane, proud resident of Palm Beach Gardens now. Um, Welcome. I'm here tonight in my capacity as the chairman of economic development for the PGA Corridor Association. Uh, first, we'd like to thank all of you for participating in our annual economic forecast event this January with Hank Fishkind. As you know, it was sold out. It was spectacular. And we're very proud to enter, I think, our 23rd year of that particular event now. We do have our Honda uh, Classic kickoff coming up in February. You all are certainly invited to it. And then we have the State of the City Address coming in April, which is a big part of our annual um, calendar. I'm very pleased to say that Matheson Whittles, our law firm, will be the sponsor of that event. We believe there are a lot of important things happening in the city, and we are very committed and want to be part of what's going forward. Um, with that, my final comment will be, on behalf of my association, my board of directors and members, we want to reiterate our very strong support for the city's adoption of the mobility plan, 
we believe this mobility plan serves not only our corridor, uh, but the city and also Northern Palm Beach County as a whole. It's a step in the right direction. It moves towards solving problems and we appreciate your courage in moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the city manager report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a few items to bring to your attention tonight. I'm going to ask Todd Engel, our city engineer, to come up. Todd's going to talk a little bit about the FEMA flood map update that's been going on here lately and talk to us a little bit about the Virgin Train uh, Railroad Crossing schedule uh, for the double tracking. So, Todd, if you would. Good evening, Council. Todd Engel, City Engineer. Just wanted to get an update. We've actually had a submittal of the closures of the crossings within our area. Uh, these are the particular crossings and, and these are the dates, but we'll go over them in greater detail. Uh, the train corridor through our area runs right down the <laughs> corridor, just on the west side of Old Dixie. The crossings that affect us, although all of them aren't in our jurisdictional boundaries, North Lake Boulevard and uh, Richard Road are not within our jurisdictional boundaries, but they will affect our police and fire response. The crossings in purple are the ones that are physically owned by Palm Beach Gardens, and they have submitted a permit to us, and we'll issue that permit when time comes. We'll just go over the actual the way the closures are going to work. The first closure will be North Lake Boulevard, and that'll start in May. Should run about five, six days. Then they're going to jump over to Burns Road, and again, that'll they're going to run the same time period, not the same time period, but no closures are supposed to be at the same time, so they're going to one, run one after the other, but never in the same order. The next one will be Hood Road, May 12th through the 17th, and they're going to run back over to Richard Road, May 18th through the 21st, come over to RCA Boulevard, that'll be May 21st through the 26th, Lighthouse Drive, June 1st through the 7th, Donald Ross Road, June 12th through the 16th. And the last will be Kyoto Gardens Drive, and that'll be 626 through uh, July 3rd. And so that's, that's pretty much how they're gonna lay out. Again, no closure is supposed to be closed at the same time, so we'd have less interruptions, and they're going to stagger those closures so we can route our, our traffic as well as our police and fire. Uh, just to go over each closure of what the detours are, North Lake Boulevard will be Old Dixie and Richard Road. Richard Road will obviously be North Lake Boulevard. Lighthouse Drive, you can use Holly, Ironwood Road, or Riverside to get back over to Burns Road, or you can use MacArthur to come back down to North Lake Boulevard. Burns Road, you can use the RCA crossing or come back down to the Lighthouse crossing. RCA could be Burns or you can use Kyoto Gardens Drive through Executive Center Drive. Kyoto Gardens Drive will be the RCA crossing or the Hood Road crossing. Hood Road will be Kyoto and Donald Ross, and Donald Ross will be Hood as well as Frederick Small Road to the north. So with that, I do have two members of Brightline and the construction company here. If you have any questions of me or if you have any questions of them, we'd be happy to answer any questions. So just to reiterate that there's not going to be any two closures at the same time, what about north and south of us when you go into Lake Park and Jupiter? What is their schedule? Is it going to be closely tied? I didn't particularly put those on there. I did put the North Lake, which is in the Lake Park area, and Richard Road, which is in North Palm. Uh, the only other one I would imagine would be the uh, Old Dixie Crossing going down Park Avenue there. Do you know the time of the closures for that particular one? Okay, these, these crossings will be on their website and as well, we'll have it on our website and we'll link it, we'll link their website as well. So these are tentative, subject to change. So this is the best knowledge that we have to date and we're gonna start in May. School gets out the 1st of June, so hopefully that lighthouse closure is, is not so bad. Does anybody have any questions? Did we ever get an answer on those railroad ties that we keep getting letters from the residents about that are the pieces of concrete laying along the track? And believe me, they, there are a number of emails and keep phone coming. calls that we get about the unsightly <clears throat> trash sitting on the side of the tracks. Would you, would you like to come up? 
You can introduce yourself. Name and address for the record, please. Katie Mitzner with Bright Line 3454 Curbing Oaks Way in Orlando. Um, we have a total of 440,000 ties um, for the phase two construction project from West Palm to Orlando. I believe we had our seventh rail train um, do a delivery uh, on Monday, and we will have a number more rail trains doing delivery. So we are putting those rail ties in various locations um, along the corridor. So that's well, the not, they're not the ties we're talking about. We're talking about oh. the old ties. When you're done, will mm -hmm. you take the old ties along with your excess stuff that's laying mm -hmm. along that double track? I'm sorry, can you please come to the microphone? Thank you. Sorry, I'm Jennifer Donaldson with HSR Constructors. We're, our office is out of Melbourne, but we have an office in Port Pierce. You're referring to all the old FEC ties that are along the corridor. Um, right now, if they are in our way, we will move them out of the way. Um, we're still working on, we, we hear it everywhere. Um, we know they're kind of an eyesore. Um, we're trying to work out a deal to help clean that up, um, but right now it's, we're just trying to get them out of our way so we can get out of your way as fast as possible. But. Is there anything that we can do to help in that process? With um, our FEC is just FEC and um, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, if you have a place to take them or um, are willing to participate, they will probably entertain it. Um, but I mean, that's all. I mean, as far as screaming and letter writing and residents doing uh, something. I'm not sure that would help <laughs> your case, but we can, we'll report it up and let them know. Quick technical question, are these, are, and I should know this, I, maybe I do and I just forgot, but the tracks, are they gonna be on the east side of the existing tracks or on the west side of the existing tracks? I believe we are adding them to the west side. The, the fiber west deck side. bank is going on the east and that's what the early clearing is for and the tracks will go to the west. Although at Kyoto, the reason for that, why that closure is a little bit longer is there is a track shift right in the middle. You can see the curve and so we will probably be switching where the new track is on the east and then on the west on the other side of that curve. And the crossings are gonna be developed in order to allow us to apply for quiet zones. Yes. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, there's a lot of cable that's running underneath the tracks. Yes. Is that just for communication along the tracks or is that fiber optics for phone systems or is it just strictly to Brightline? It's both. So it is a shared duck bank between FEC for all their train signal and it is a shared duck bank with all the carriers. So Verizon, CenturyLink, AT&T, Resurgence Level 3, they all have duck banks through there and we are relocating that okay. as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Is there any more? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Todd. I do have one more comment. We do have the Lighthouse Crossing as well as the Burns Road Crossing, which is that corridor where those ties are. We're going to make that permit subject to removing of those ties. So we're at least going to put, try to put some teeth in the permit to, to subject to removal of those ties once they're completed with the project. Thanks, Todd. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have anything else, Todd? No, I have a, another report. Okay. Are we done with the trains? We are. Thank you. Move on. Thank you. No, Thank you, both. Thanks, guys. Next report, we're going to give you an update on the FEMA, the FEMA high hazard coastal study that's being done. The last FEMA update was done uh, October of 2017. It was about an eight-year process we went through with FEMA. They were updating their standard flood maps that they update every so often. And that just looks at, at standard house paths through standard storm events and how they update their maps. In working with FEMA through that process, we were able to remove 1,230 residents out of the FEMA flood plain. And that was based on their old data had, these homes weren't developed yet, the developments weren't there, so we were able to get South Florida Water Management D District permits and other data to them to remove all those homes out of the actual flood plain. So to date, we have two residential units in a flood plain right now within the city of Palm Beach Gardens, and they're both right on the intercoastal waterway. So now what FEMA is doing, they, back in 2014, they started their coastal high risk mitigation flood maps. And it takes a look at 
at the entire coast and how factors affect the coast during high hazard events. What they look at is essentially what we're referring to as the perfect storm. If you have a category four or category five storm approaching right at whatever point they're studying, you also have extremely high tides, you have extremely high waves, you've had extended raid periods for 14 days and extremely high winds, how that affects a certain area. It's highly unlikely that that's all gonna happen at particularly one time, but that's what the study does. So areas around the coast within Palm Beach Gardens We've seen that floodplain rise from one to two feet, and that does affect our residential owners. This map here in red subjects all the areas within, within our city, which is in the jurisdictional boundary, that was out of the flood maps and now currently are proposed to be back into the flood maps. Mainly the uh, communities being affected is Marina Gardens, Harbor Oaks, Nature's Hideaway, the Meadows Trailer Park, as well as Prosperity Oaks, one roadway there. This is a little close look. This is Harbor Oaks. You have Marina Gardens. You have the Meadows. You have Nature's Hideaway here in Prosperity Oaks Court. Every one of those homes are subject to go back into the FEMA flood map through this high hazard. So everything in red will be required to have actual flood insurance if they hold a mortgage. So we've calculated that to be approximately 305 homes. So we went from basically 1,232 to two, and now we're coming back to, which would be 307 homes that will be subject to flood insurance. Where FEMA is in the process, back in 2014, they notified us that they were doing a preliminary phase that has been complete. They've held some public meetings that we attended in the last two days. It was very poorly attended by the public. I think we were there for three hours and we've noticed six members from the public were there. It was held down in West Palm Beach. Now they are in their 90 days appeal process, but we don't know when that appeal process is gonna start. So the, the time that it starts is unknown. Once they get to the appeals process, we have 90 days or anybody else has 90 days to appeal that process. The county's already said they're going to appeal and we're looking through our data right now to see if it's gonna be beneficial for us to appeal this process. Then during that process, after that process is done, they have the right to correct or deny any of the appeal processes. We don't know how long that's gonna take either. Either last time they did this, two and a half years is what that process took. So we're still looking a lot of time out here and there's a lot of data. Then there's a six month process after that, once they establish the maps, that the maps go into effect and then those houses will be required to have flood insurance. So the good news is that Florida ranks 51 out of all the states of flood insurance costs. So our average flood insurance costs for homes, and we have, obviously we have bigger homes that are gonna cost more, or lower homes that are gonna cost less based on square footage costs, proximity to the coast. So we, on average, pay the less of any state in the country based on the fact that the way we develop with our surface water management systems and set our house pads at the proper elevations. So if we look at the 305 residents That's that would go constant. back into the system and an average of $563, we're looking at 171,000 plus per year for those residents to be paid based on what's currently being proposed through the FEMA flood maps. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. Quick question, how does one appeal? Like, what are you gonna, how, how do you appeal that? This is different than the last time. The last time basically said this was a swamp and it still shows as a swamp. Well, we built Mirasol, obviously we fixed everything in there. So we're able to determine that this house pad now physically sits above the grade through surveys and FEMA flood certificates. What's happening here is this is an existing home that meets that flood elevation. They're raising the elevation of the water. So there's two ways to do it. You raise the house, mitigate the hazard, or you pay the insurance. Now we've, we've looked Briefly, and we looked at the meadows, they appear to be well above the flood hazard, so we believe we can get a lot of them out because they're elevated houses anyway. So they're looking at the land adjacent to the house, not at the actual house. But we've got to look at all the data to find out where they sit and to find out where FEMA sets that flood elevation. If they're a foot above and FEMA raises it two feet, there's no way we can get them out of that flood hazard. So you, again, you either raise a house or you pay the insurance. Well, for $563 a year, you're probably just better to pay the insurance. Than yes, and the, the most of the Marina Gardens and Harbor Oaks are three-story townhomes, so they're not likely to happen. 
Okay. If Any I may, uh, if you look at this thing from the 10,000 foot level with FEMA, uh, FEMA benefits from flood insurance because they derive revenue from that. You may be totally aware that there have been a lot of natural disasters lately, and FEMA's budget has been, you know, pretty well decimated by all of the payments they've made. Now, I'm not saying that they would go around and do anything like come back two years later and redo the flood map so they could pump up their budget, but it certainly does give one opportunity to think, why are we doing this? When you consider our rates are so low because we don't flood, the revenues generated to FEMA from flood insurance through the state of Florida goes up north to where all the flooding occurs. This has been a recurring problem for years and years and years. We're funding the flooding uh, recoveries that FEMA takes care of in the northern cities where counties and the western sides of Midwest as well. So that's always been sort of a, a cyclical type of thing that goes on with FEMA and uh, you know, you can figure it out for yourself, I guess. Any questions? Is this tied in at all to the assessments that are being done for vulnerabilities due to sea level rise? Is that where this is coming from? Is it tied into there at all, or this is completely independent from those studies? This is mainly hazard, meaning hurricanes, high tides, winds, saturation of rain, those are the events that they're looking for. So it's a hazard event. It is not a... a but there, that's the, the hazard is part of the vulnerability studies that the uh, Regional Climate Compact and all are looking at, too, because you have your base level, but then it's not until the storm comes that that level is going to rise to a point where it can cause problems in some places. So I was just wondering if this was tied into the work that they're doing if Two. I may, keep in mind, this is a one in 500 year storm. Mm -hmm. It has, they're not calculating the rising seas or global warming. This is a one in 500 year storm they're planning for, and it has to be a perfect storm. Gotcha. The, the, the tides that they look at are the king high tides we experience in November and October of every year where we do get minor flooding that we've had for a long time. All right, thank you. Anything else on if your... If I may continue, yes. Um, there are a few things. Uh, I've asked if you would uh, give us a minute here. I've asked uh, Max Lohman, our city attorney, to bring us up to date on uh, some litigation that's going on so we could get it up front in the meeting because I know a lot of you are getting questions in the community about some of these issues. And so I've asked uh, Mr. Lohman to bring us up to date a little bit earlier in the agenda, if you don't mind. If you would. That's fine. Go ahead, Max. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to talk to you real quick. You can take a few seconds and bet on the over-under if you want. But I, I don't, uh, <laughs> okay, everybody get that. Yeah. <laughs> take your by squares or however you however you work it out. Um, I, I do not plan to take anywhere near 22 minutes. Um, there's been some information. Uh, you're all aware of the of the lawsuits that that, that uh, the city got involved in because of our efforts uh, to amend our charter over the years. I mean, we started this uh, this effort to amend our charter um, all the way back in 2012. Um, then you fast forward to all the way up to 2016, and then uh, two years ago, now almost two years ago, and we finally uh, achieved amending some of these things and correcting some of the major deficiencies in our charter. And there's some misinformation that's gone around. Um, there were four different lawsuits brought over since 2016 um, by Mr. Dinerstein. The, to the total cost to the city for those lawsuits and attorney's fees and costs is just under $100,000. Now, it's important to know that while that seems like a large number, um, you have to consider that that is at the rate that um, I bill the city at. That's not a commercial rate. Um, a commercial rate puts that cost much closer to about $225,000. So if we were paying a commercial rate, that's what the taxpayers would have been looking at, at a minimum. Um, there's also some misinformation about what was prevailed on and what wasn't prevailed on <clears throat> and what the Charter Amendments did. Um, and just so you all know, I think you're all aware, but so the public knows, 
the most recent charter amendment that was challenged uh, was the big, the major renovate, rewrite or amendment to our charter. Um, we prevailed at trial court on summary judgment. We ended up going to the Fourth District Court of Appeal. They appealed that decision to the Fourth District Court of Appeal. We briefed it. Uh, I asked for oral argument. The court granted oral argument, and we prevailed in oral argument, and we got a very um, well-written opinion, um, a unanimous opinion, a procurium opinion from the court. Um, they have subsequently now, uh, Mr. Dinerstein, through his attorney, has uh, sought to invoke the discretionary jurisdiction of the Florida Supreme Court, um, which, as a lawyer, I kind of, I'm great, I'd love to go. Um, uh, with, I, uh, really enjoy it. Um, as your attorney and what's best for the city, I, I really don't want them to grant um, discretionary jurisdiction. I don't think it's particularly likely, um, even though they're arguing that they construed a specific provision of the Florida Constitution. Again, uh, my own professional enjoyment of going up and potentially arguing in the Florida Supreme Court notwithstanding, I don't really think that's the best thing for the city. Um, but that's where we are on that. Some of the misinformation is that, as you know, but I think it's important for the public to know, that charter amendment, um, it's been said that, um, it's been propagated that the, these amendments were to uh, remove charter reviews and remove the city manager, and then but for these lawsuits, all these things were happening. Um, the charter review wasn't removed from the, from the charter, um, the, the, this charter amendment was challenged, that, that wasn't removed. The city manager residency was a separate question. Um, the lawsuit that was brought had nothing to do with that and didn't prevail on that. Um, the, the only thing that was challenged out of this second go around of referendum uh, amendments was the major renovation to the charter, the, the big repeal and readoption that took all the illegal provisions out of our charter. It's also being propagated that this charter amendment somehow took all these things and powers out of the charter and I was shocked to learn that they had been miraculously conferred upon me, which I, read the chart, I wrote it, and I read it, and I'm like, I kept looking in there for all these magical powers being conferred upon me, and I could not find them anywhere, so I thought it was important that people understand that that's not true. There's also been this proliferation that, um, that these lawsuits have been brought on behalf of the people. Um, nothing could be more false than that. Um, for those of you who don't know, th that's my job. That's, that's what I do. I defend the city of Palm Beach Gardens, this body politic. My job is to defend the people because that's who you guys represent. The council puts things on the charter, puts it out there for the voters to vote on it, and you give the, the voters the opportunity to express their will. And so when I have to go into court to defend those charter provisions that you put before the voters, that's what we're doing. Somebody that's suing the city is not defending the public and the rights of the voters. They're, they're putting forth their own self-interest. There's also been information that's gone around that and that this has all been done on, on uh, Mr. Dinerstein's dime, and he spent h h thousands and thousands of dollars um, litigating against the city. Well, his attorney says he's doing it pro bono, so somebody is telling a lie. I don't like using euphemisms like falsehoods and misrepresentations, because that's just patty caking around. Okay, you're either paying your lawyer or you're not paying your lawyer. So either a sworn member of the Florida Bar is lying, or Mr. Dinerstein is lying. Which one is, is immaterial to me, but somebody's not being square. So I'm not so convinced that, that money's being spent to propagate these things other than to put forth personal um, desire. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that because this has been going around a while and we've been fighting these battles for so long and it's just really not fair that the public doesn't know what's really happening here. There's not been any um, sinister motivation to try and subvert the will of the public um, that's actually what Mr. Dinerstein did with this lawsuit. The amendment passed. The voters voted to amend their charter, and he wasn't happy with that because the language that he wanted in there, he wanted to stay in there that left holes in our charter and made it easy for people to kind of get in here and screw things up, that all came out. It was all done that way. We took a charter that was substantively, if you take out the legal description, was about 18 pages, almost 24 pages of just outdated mess, dating all the way back to 1976, most of it. And we, we chopped it down to about eight pages. Um, your municipal, your charter is your municipal constitution and it's supposed to be a very simple, clean, logically set, uh, organized document so that it provides the framework upon which you can hang your ordinances, your municipal laws. That's the purpose of it. It doesn't have to be nearly as detailed as the U.S. Constitution because we have a state constitution and the U.S. Constitution and we have home rule. 
<clears throat> before home rule, charters had to have a litany of powers and authority listed in them. So, because if you didn't have them listed, you didn't have the authority to do it. Well, after the Home Rule uh, Powers Act was passed, you didn't have to do that anymore. So I just wanted to clear the air on that and make sure that people understood what the truth was about this. So the city has not spend, spent three or 400,000 or $500,000 defending these lawsuits. And besides that, we were sued. We didn't get sued. We didn't sue anybody. We were sued, so we have an obligation to defend. The sum total, if you even round up and tweak all the numbers, it's still under $100,000 to defend four lawsuits, which I don't know. Maybe I'm biased as a lawyer. That's, that may seem like a big number. That's cheap, folks. That's, uh, that is a very, very small number um, to prosecute, to, to defend four lawsuits for less than $100,000. Um, the other two lawsuits, the other lawsuits we have on right now, as you're aware, the Transform uh, Operating Stores and Forbes Cohen at the mall. We filed our deck action to ask the court to tell us what our obligation was. Their, uh, their response was to come over the top and, and allege constitutional violations, um, which again, I think are incredibly specious and not likely to go anywhere. Um, they did the same thing in the Forbes Cohen lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit against Transform asking a deck action for them to declare the rights of the parties pursuant to their agreements. We weren't even a party to it. And then in their counterclaim, Transform, doing business as Sears, came over the top and alleged the exact same constitutional claims as if we had something to do with their dispute. Um, we have, I think, a very well thought out strategy to move forward with these cases. I'm happy to talk to that, uh, to each of you individually about that. I'm not going to um, throw out there what we plan to do right now um, in public, but um, I think we're in, in good shape. The cases are just, they're kind of, well, in a word, they're absurd. They're, they're more ridiculous than the last time. They're, they don't really have any basis in reality, in my opinion, but only time will tell. As I've told you, you can be 100% right, and Mr. Lane knows this, and still only got a 50-50 shot. <laughs> so, but I, I think we're in, in very sound footing, and y I think you all know where we're at in the mobility, mobility plan. I think we're in very good shape there. Does anybody have any questions yes. uh, regarding either the first set of lawsuits or the Sears lawsuit? Sure. Um, Max, you were kind enough to send us the link, so I had a chance to watch your performance before the fourth DCA, and you were wonderful. You really were thorough and thoughtful and uh, did an excellent job representing our city. Um, a quick note, different people can talk about different motivations. I can tell you that Sid, and, as you know, Sid and I are, Sid and I are good friends. Um, I think his heart's pure, his motives are good. He tries to do what he thinks is right. Um, but your, watching you was just a pleasure before the fourth DCA. I, I, uh, if you go to the Supremes, it'd be fun to watch you as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Anyone else with any questions? Carl? No, there's no need to talk about it because we're all ingrained in the charter. We all know every word of it. We five voted on it, and um, you know, mobility will take its own course. We're familiar with the mall issues, so let Max do what he's hired to do. Well, from a personal standpoint, you know, the, the hard part is is there's always this conspiracy theory that's out in public about government, not just this city, but in general, and sometimes our newspapers like to take the the little guy's side and big bad government, but I can't thank you enough for defending uh, the city on these matters because um, now that I was a resident and I'm still always a resident and sit in this chair, I can't say how well this city runs and how good it does for its residents. And I just don't understand some individuals in the city that choose to try to make a mockery of government at our city because our city is really a model. So. I appreciate some of the friendships that some people may have, but I personally don't understand the, the personal vendetta that some people may have towards the city. But thank you for doing what you do, and we will continue to do our job here as best we can to make sure the residents of our city and our neighbors to the north, south, and west, and east are uh, best represented as best we can. So anything else? Well Still more. One other item, I just want to make an announcement. Last Saturday, we sort of got rained out with the trucks and stuff. Uh, this Saturday at our operations center, which is at the end of uh, Johnson Dairy Road, uh, we still have our event trucks and stuff uh, from 11 to 2. 
I believe it is. And we still have a lot of hot dogs that will be free. So we want to invite everyone out for the free hot dog. But we have a facility out there that's brand new. Uh, we have a lot of uh, fire apparatus, police cars, heavy equipment, uh, and a lot of things for the children to get involved with in uh, checking out uh, what it is that something other than police and fire that goes on in this city. So we invite the public out, 800 hot dogs. If you don't eat them, we're going to have to. So come on out and help us out. Michelle, the weather's going to be all right on Saturday, I think, yeah? Are we, uh, <laughs> well, we'll blame you if it's not. We also have softball. That's right. Yes, we do. So let's, let's now get to our meeting at 8.35 p.m. So thank you for the reports, um, and, and all, the, all of the um, presentations were great, very informative. Uh, let's get to the consent agenda. I assume everyone's read it. Does anybody want to make a motion? I make approve? a motion we approve the consent agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All approved. All right. So tonight, we are holding quasi-judicial hearings on the following cases. Ordinance 24, 2019, Rustic Lakes rezoning. Ordinance 25, 2019, Bay Hill Commons rezoning. Resolution 5, 2020, plan unit development site plan for Bay Hill Commons. Ordinance 26, 2019, the southeast corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and 112th Terrace North rezoning. Resolution 6, Planned Unit Development Site Plan for W&W and W 9. This means that the City Council is required by law to, state its, uh, to base its decision on the evidence contained in the record of this proceeding, which consists of the testimony at the hearing, the materials which are in the official city file on this application, and any documents presented during this hearing. The Council is also required by law to allow cross-examination of any witnesses who testify tonight. Cross-examination may occur after the staff, the applicant, and other participants have made their presentations and will be permitted in the order of the witnesses' appearance. It is necessary that anyone who testifies at the hearing remain until the conclusion of the hearing in order to be able to respond to any questions. If you plan to testify this evening or wish to offer written comments, please fill out a card and give to the City Clerk. The City Clerk will now swear in all persons who intend to offer testimony this evening on any of these cases. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Can the clerk please read title Ordinance 1 2020? Ordinance 1 2020, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending the City of Palm Beach Gardens budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2019, and ending September 30, 2020. Inclusive, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Open the public hearing. Has anything changed since first reading? Uh, <clears throat> good evening, Mr. Mayor and oh, Council. You. Alan Owens, for the record, Finance Administrator. We do have one additional item. Uh, if, if, with the pleasure of the Council, I could just hit the highlights of that yes, item. Yes, please. Okay. Um, so with the recent adoption and implementation of the uh, mobility fee, uh, staff has been working with planning and zoning and also building department on refining our projections for the current fiscal year. And so what this budget and memory reflects is the two items before you. We have estimated uh, mobility fee revenue this year to be $2 million, and we are allocating that $2 million to the capital improvements program in the mobility fee fund. This also uh, entailed setting up an entirely new capital improvement fund. So. Uh, with that one change, everything else remains the same from first reading, and staff does still recommend approval. Any questions? Nope. So these dollars are basically going to be held for capital improvement projects until Yes, we... sir. Correct. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There's no uh, common cards on this, so we'll close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll make a motion. Second. Bring back for discussion. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 5-0. Thank you. Uh, Ordinance 21 2019, second reading. Can the clerk read the title? Ordinance 21 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a text amendment to its comprehensive development plan in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, specifically Section 163.3184 at Sequentes Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPTA 19 08. 
that provides for an amendment to the future land use element to provide updates to certain tabular data, nomenclature, and other amendments that assign newly created zoning districts to the appropriate future land use designation, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the front desk for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Thank you, we'll open the hearing. Hi, Martin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, for the record, my name is Martin Fitz with Planning and Zoning, and I have been sworn in. Uh, we're here tonight for the second reading of our um, Rustic Lakes uh, petitions that we first brought before the Council on the November 7th um, hearing. After that um, meeting, we uh, transmitted uh, the appropriate ordinances to the uh, Florida DEO uh, for their expedited review. They did re respond uh, in December 15th. Uh, with no comments, and we are bringing uh, the petitions back uh, to the council. Uh, we have had no substantive changes uh, to the ordinances uh, and resolutions since they were first presented at the November hearing. Uh, staff is recommending approval of all 10 <laughs> ordinances and resolutions, and they will have to have a separate reading for each one and a separate vote for each one. And staff is available if you uh, have any comments, or we can go through our presentation if you like. Well, does anybody need his presentation? No. Okay, so there are no cards, so we're gonna close the hearing. I'm gonna get a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 21, 2019. So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero, thank you. Ordinance 22, 2019, can the clerk read the title? Ordinance 22, 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78 Land Development by repealing Section 78-133 RR1020 Rural Residential Districts and readopting same as revised to create the new zoning district agricultural residential adopting new Section 78.133.1 to create the new zoning district agricultural estate and by adopting new Section 133.2 to readopt the RR1020 Rural Residential Districts further providing for definitions, uses, development criteria, and related text changes. Further amending Chapter 78 at Table 9, Zoning Districts, to add the AR and AE Zoning Districts, further amending Chapter 78 by repealing Section 78-141, Residential Zoning District Regulations, and readopting same as revised, to adopt new development regulations for the AR and AE districts, further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-159, permitted uses, minor and major conditional uses, and prohibited uses, to amend Table 21 and Subsection J to adopt new development regulations for the AR and AE districts, further amending Chapter 78 at Section 78-181, uses, by adopting new Subsection C, 7, and 8, further amending Chapter 78 at section 78-186, yards, by repealing subsection B7 and readopting same as revised. Further amending chapter 78 at section 78-345, number of parking spaces required. By amending table 33, required off-street parking spaces. Further amending chapter 78 at section 78-395, recreational vehicles and watercraft by repealing subsection A and readopting same as revised, further amending chapter 78 at section 78-751 definitions, by adopting new definitions for accessory quarters, agricultural bonafide, agricultural light manufacturing, agricultural storage, bed and breakfast, equestrian arena, commercial, estate kitchen, guest cottage, nursery, wholesale, stable, commercial and stable private, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 78 shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. Can someone get the clerk a glass of water? And I did. Very nice. Okay. We'll open the public hearing. Um, there's nothing that has changed. There's no cards. So I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing.
Can you get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. A second. Any discussion? No, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Five zero, thank you. Ordinance 27, 2019, second reading and adoption. Can the clerk read the title? Ordinance 27, 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 34, Environment of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, by adopting an entirely new Section 34-62, entitled Bona Fide Agricultural Operations, to create an exemption to noise regulations, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, we're gonna open the hearing. Still nothing has changed. There's no cards on Ordinance 27, so I'm gonna close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? I move that we adopt Ordinance 27. Second. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Five zero, thank you. Ordinance 28, 2019, second reading adoption. Please read the title. Ordinance 28, 2019. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, amending Chapter 78, Property Maintenance Standards at Section 79-5, Maintenance and Appearance Standards for all real property by repealing subsection A1 and readopting same as revised, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you. you can open the public hearing. Hearing seeing that nothing has changed. There's no cards. <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and close the hearing. Motion and second to approve. I move that we adopt Ordinance 28-2019. Second. Second. Thank you. No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Five zero. Thank you. Ordinance 23-2019, second reading and adoption. Ordinance 23-2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, adopting a large-scale amendment to its comprehensive plan, future land use map, in accordance with the mandate set forth in Chapter 163, Florida Statutes, specifically Section 163.3184 at Sequentes, Florida Statutes, pursuant to application number CPMA-19-08-000029, in order to change the land use designation on 378.7 acres more or less from Palm Beach County Rural Residential, one unit per five acres, RR5, to Palm Beach Gardens Rural Residential, RR, and from Palm Beach County Commercial Low Rural Residential, one unit per five acres, CLRR-5, and Commercial Low Office Rural Residential, one unit per five acres, CL-0-RR-5, to Palm Beach Gardens Commercial C. Following annexation, the subject property being located on the south side of North Lake Boulevard, approximately one mile east of Coconut Boulevard, providing for compliance with all requirements of Chapter 163 Florida Statutes, providing for transmittal to the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, DEO, and other reviewing agencies, providing that the future land use map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for the purposes. Note to the public, there is a sign-in sheet at the front desk for anyone wanting additional information from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Thank you, there's nothing that's been changed. Uh, there's no cards on Ordinance 23, so I'm gonna close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Second. No further discussion, all in favor? Aye, Aye five zero, thank you. Ordinance 24, 2019, please. Ordinance 24, 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property, such property being located on the south side of North Lake Boulevard, approximately one mile east of Coconut Boulevard, providing that this parcel of real property, which is more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Agricultural Residential AR to Palm Beach Gardens Agricultural Residential AR for 337.95 acres more or less, and from Palm Beach County Residential Estate RE to Palm Beach Gardens Agricultural Estate AE for 20.15 acres more or less, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a complex clause, a separability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Thank you, is there any ex partes on this quasi-judicial? There are none, thank you. Uh, there is no presentation, so we're gonna, Carl, you didn't have any ex parte, correct? Negative. Thank you. Close the hearing, can I get a motion and a second to approve? I'll, make, I'll second. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Five zero. Thank you. 
Ordinance 25, 2019. Ordinance 25, 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property, such property being comprised of 9.8 acres in size, more or less, and located on the southwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and 112 Terrace North, providing that this parcel of real property, as more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Multiple Use Plan Development, MUPD, to Palm Beach Gardens Plan Unit Development, PUD, with an underlying zoning designation of Palm Beach Gardens Professional Office, PO, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and further purposes. Resolution 5, 2020 is a companion item to Ordinance 25, 2019 and will require council action. Resolution 5, 2020, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the Bay Hill Commons Plan Unit Development PUD, consisting of 9.8 acres more or less, located on the southwest corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and 112 Terrace North, as more particularly described herein, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you. So in ordinance 25, 9, 2019, any ex partes in either? No, thank you. Uh, there's no more presentations. So on ordinance 25, can I, I'm gonna close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? We're, we're on ordinance 25, right? Ordinance 25. Motion from Carl. Did you make the motion? Yeah, Maria, okay. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye, five zero, thank you. And resolution five, 2020, uh, no other presentation, there's no cards. So I'm gonna close the hearing. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Second. Maria, I'll give you, I'll give Matt that one. Uh, hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye, Aye five zero, thank you. Ordinance 26, 2019. Ordinance 26, 2019, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, rezoning certain real property, such property being comprised of 10.8 acres in size, more or less, and located on the southeast corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and 112 Terrace North, providing that this parcel of real property, which is more particularly described herein, shall be rezoned from Palm Beach County Multiple Use Plan Development, MUPD, to Palm Beach Gardens Plan Unit Development, PUD, with an underlying zoning designation of Palm Beach Gardens Professional Office, PO, providing that the zoning map of the City of Palm Beach Gardens be amended accordingly, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date for other purposes. Resolution 6, 2020 is a companion item to Ordinance 26, 2019, and will require council action. Resolution 6, 2020, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, approving the W and W I X Plan Unit Development PUD, consisting of 10.8 acres more or less, located on the southeast corner of the intersection of North Lake Boulevard and 112 Terrace North, as more particularly described herein, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Well, that's just cruel and unusual punishment there. And if we all weren't here, we'd all be falling asleep. So thank you, Patty, for that. That's uh, the best clerk in town. Um, back to Ordinance 20. <laughs> <laughs> the only clerk in town, sorry. <laughs> it's a lot of reading, a lot of technical reading. So. <laughs> Ordinance 26, 2019, we're going to close. Well, is, is there any ex partes in either? No. Okay, thank you. No need for another uh, presentation. So we're going to, no cards on either. So I'm going to close the hearing. Can I get a motion? Second on Ordinance 26. So moved. Oh, second. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? Okay, and resolution, resolution 6, 2020. Can I get a motion and a second to approve? So moved. Maria and Carl, any, no, no discussion, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye, five zero, thank you. All right, so we are done with all of that. We have a resolution that we want to be, begin to discuss. Uh, this was brought upon us uh, from members of the Jewish community, uh, namely the Chabad and others that are concerned about anti growing anti-Semitism in the country. And uh, as a result, they invited the council to um, visit with them and let us hear some of the stories that are going on in New York and other places in the country. So uh, we didn't give a lot of direction, but I think the idea here today, Max, is to give you some direction on how we want to proceed with this resolution. Uh, Rochelle was also there with me, and as a member of the Jewish community, I thought maybe I'd let her 
start the conversation. But you're not Jewish, neither am I. Okay, well, three of the events that I went to this week and then two online conferences uh, also dealt with anti-Semitism. So it is a big topic in the Jewish community right now, and part of the problem is getting the wider community to pay attention to things that don't ordinarily affect them directly. So thank you, Mark and uh, Carl, for going to Chabad last week uh, to hear that. Um, the representatives of the Jewish community, including the Jewish Federation, the Jewish Community Relations Council, and our Jewish community religious leaders and residents have been speaking out to us about doing something. Um, the resolution that Max put forward through no fault of his own, because we were not very clear last time when we, we discussed Please excuse me, that wasn't uh, a resolution, Max? No, Ma the one we, we got as a sample resolution. That was given to us, to us by from the Chabad. Chabad. Yes. Oh, that was the one. Okay. Yes, that excuse was, me. was given to us. That resolution came from Hallandale. It dealt only with BDS, which is the Boycott, uh, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement. It's only one facet of current anti-Semitism. And it's really not, I don't think, what our community is looking for. As I mentioned, the Federation, the community, Jewish Community Relations Council, and other religious leaders and residents want us to address anti-Semitism in a more complete manner, something more similar to what the Florida legislature passed. They amended Section K-20 of the Education Code that defined what anti-Semitism is, what it represents, and how it would not be acceptable in schools and communities. It was also something similar passed by Congress and signed by the President. The definitions and explanations used in those two bills are based on the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or the IHRA. It's an organization that represents 31 member Holocaust um, 31 member organizations and countries. And they've come up with this definition that's being used worldwide. Uh, I think it's the one that our resolution should be based on. The American Jewish Committee also launched a Mayors Against Anti-Semitism campaign where they invited mayors and municipal leaders uh, to sign on to their campaign and some of the ideas that they have um, on their uh, statement are also worth taking a look at and perhaps including in ours. So I'm requesting that we postpone any real discussion on the topic until the March meeting, that we get some of this information to Max and give him some options other than taking a Hallandale Beach resolution on BDS and trying to forge it into what we want. And uh, it gives us all more time to talk to uh, to the community. Um, what they're really looking for is to know that our community recognizes uh, the Jewish community's right to live in peace, safety, and free from the worry of anti-Semitic attacks. And that as individuals, that we won't hesitate to call it out wherever and whenever we see it. Um, it's worth noting that the city of Poway, California, the site of the last mass synagogue shooting was roughly the size of Palm Beach Gardens and they didn't think it could happen there either. So I think it's, it's an important thing to tackle. I just don't think what we have to work with so far is sufficient. Thank you, Sean. Matt, do you have any comments? Yeah, I do. Um, as a past member of the board of the uh, Anti-Defamation League, I, I think this resolution is very important. There's obviously no place uh, for anti-Semitism in our hearts or in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, I, I've been talking with the, the people as well, and what they, we definitely should be passing a resolution, but they have a lot that they want us to do with this resolution. They're gonna refine what, what we have and, and hopefully at the next meeting give us uh, something uh, concrete that, that we can work with, so I think Rochelle's right on with what she's saying. There was one other uh, point on, on there that I think we have to be careful with. It, it, I don't think it's our goal to try and solve the Mideast Israel-Palestinian conflict and, and statements in a resolution probably should not be there. 
that try to do that. Um, there were some in that state, that, that resolution Mine, as well. To, yeah, 50 um, to 64. Uh, What's that? Coming out against hate and anti-Semitism and what it is does not have to, you know, bridge into specifics on how we're gonna solve that problem. I'm sorry, Mar what were you saying, Maria? I didn't. Lines 50 through 64 in this current, um, res in this current resolution are, that's a matter of foreign policy. It's not, it, it's not what we need to be dealing with, it's we need to be more basic. And I agree with Rochelle about getting more input on a more specific, but yet uh, more complete yeah, resolution. I have, I have the other, the other Carl, do you have any comments on any of this? I'm on board with the direction you guys are going. There's really nothing to me, for me to add. You, you know. Well, I, th I think that's pretty much right. And you know, we are a city, we're not a state nor a nation. Um, resolutions are what we can do, and they are strong um, statements on how we feel and what our residents feel. So I'd like to, instead of trying to hash out language now, let's all make sure we bring uh, Max some information that we think, that you think is adequate for a resolution, Max, and if you can filter it down and uh, bring it to us next month and hopefully we'll be able to vote on it at that time. Is that fair? Sure. Or tweak it more. Or tweak it more, but we really have nothing to start with here, but I'm glad that we're trying, that we're all on the same page and what our role in all of this is and what our ultimate goal is. Uh, you know, we live in a pretty diverse city and a region, not even not the most diverse city, but we certainly live in a pretty diverse region, and uh, it still shocks me and saddens me that people look to uh, vilify people based on sex, sexual preference, religion, color, creed, whatever. So whatever we can do to help is what we should do. Uh, any other comments from the council about anything? I just wanna make one comment if I may. Um, this has been an interesting year as mayor, so I wanna thank everyone for giving me the confidence. I know I've got another meeting to go, but I'm gonna let everybody know in public uh, that I won't be seeking the mayor's role next year. Uh, although I am happy to stay on council and be a part of it. I also wanted to make a comment that, um, two things. One, I think there might be a time as the city continues to grow that we consider at our next charter review to have the voters vote for the mayor, uh, mainly because I think the city is big enough and there's enough large enough policies that go on in the city that should have a, a consistent voice. Uh, people still think that Maria is the mayor. Uh, we share the same initials. We're both short Italians with short hair, but other than that, we're very, well, not that different, but, um, and it's just a testament to how hard you worked the past two years, and it's been a pleasure trying to follow your footsteps on that, but um, I think it's wise that residents know who their mayor is, and with that, I also want to make sure that whoever is mayor in the future, next year, years after that, that communications run through the mayor's office better when it comes to community events, because I think the voice and the message has to be consistent, and that's why we elect a mayor. Now, we've got a very good council, and we all understand what's going on here, but I think it should be better served to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that the mayor's position, whoever that person is gonna be, is uh, the person that is given an opportunity to get out and speak and, and be a part of it, and everybody should be invited to those events unless there's a sunshine risk. So. That's just my thoughts on, on as I've sat through this, uh, this journey for the past year, that uh, the next mayor is given an opportunity to be, the, be the, the, the continued and consistent voice of what the city wants to project as we go in to whatever issues come forward. Hope I didn't offend anybody by saying that. That's just a thought. And uh, other than that, I'm happy to uh, finish my comments. Does anybody else have any comments they wanna make before we go? Great. All right. With that, we're going to adjourn. I'm so hungry.